Ready for more of the why behind cruising? If you were among the hundreds of thousands that saw Cruisely's first video on crazy things that don't make sense on a cruise, then you saw our explanations on everything from tiny pools to short port stays. But with ships this large, there are plenty more crazy things where that came from. Because cruising is so unique, there are many things that are done way differently when you're at sea compared to what you'd see on land. And at first glance, some of those things don't seem to make any sense. But when you actually dig into the why behind them, you begin to see there are some real reasons things are the way they are. With that in mind, don't forget to check out our original video that is linked in the description below. And here are six more things that may not make sense on a cruise at first, but actually have some very good reasons behind them. Imagine if you were at home and went to a restaurant. There, you would have an assigned dime to arrive and an assigned table to sit at with other people that you don't know before the start of your meal and an assigned waiter. Chances are that you would probably avoid that restaurant. That sort of structure is just so foreign to many of us. On a cruise ship, however, it's the traditional way of eating in the main dining room. Frankly, it's crazy that it still exists this way. We can't think of anyone that likes to be told when to eat and with whom they will eat. Still, it is a holdover from the older days of cruising that does seem to help the cruise lines to better anticipate the crowds and spread things out over several hours instead of having a big rush to eat all at once. Even so, the traditional way of dining does seem to be moving toward a more flexible way to eat. Anytime dining, where you simply show up when you're hungry and you're seated on your own like you do at any other restaurant, is available across cruise lines. Some cruise lines, like Norwegian with its freestyle cruising, make not having a set dining time or a pre-assigned seat a marketing point. Bottom line is that it's crazy to expect a bunch of strangers to be seated together and for people to have a fixed dining time while on their vacation. Fortunately, those days seem to be slowly ending. Drinking on a cruise ship is a big business. You step on board and you'll see bar after bar after bar. A dozen bars on a cruise ship, that's considered normal. Drinks are pricey. It's not unusual to spend six or eight bucks on a beer or 10 to $12 on a cocktail. You can spend hundreds on alcohol during your cruise. Of course, to help people better budget, there are drink packages. These deals have you pay one set daily fee and then you can get almost anything you want on ship without worrying about your budget. But another way to save some cash is to take advantage of the rules regarding bringing wine or champagne. Cruise lines often let you bring a bottle per adult when you board. It's not a lot, but it can save you some money. What's crazy though, is that even though you can bring some wine or champagne, no liquor or beer is allowed. It seems obvious that cruise lines don't want people bringing all their own alcohol on the ship and not purchasing it on board. But if you can bring a small amount of wine or champagne, why not a small amount of other alcohol? For instance, a bottle of wine contains about five glasses. It seems like being able to bring a six pack of beer would be in the same ballpark. While there's no official word on why beer or liquor, even in small amounts, isn't allowed to be brought on board, it seems like the money would be a motivating factor. Even a six pack of cheap beer would be worth almost $40 if it sells for $6 a can on the cruise ship. A modern cruise ship can easily hold 4,000 passengers. Some of the biggest can hold 6,000. Add to that, there's limited time in port with most stops being eight or nine hours. But instead of getting off whenever you want and walking down the pier into the port of call, you have to wait on a tender in some ports. A tender is simply a smaller boat that takes cruise passengers from the ship anchored out at sea into a port. Usually there are a number of these boats running constantly throughout the day, picking up a few dozen passengers at once and taking them into port and then picking up at a port and taking them back to the ship. Tenders themselves aren't that crazy. They're used widely in sailing. But in the cruise industry, where a single ship can cost more than a billion dollars and have thousands of people on board, it seems strange that you still have this slow way of actually getting into a port of call. First, you have to wait for a boat to dock against the ship, then load it, slowly make your way into shore, and then do it all over again to get back to the cruise ship. The reason for these tenders is that some ports simply don't have the facilities to handle such large ships, 
as well as water that isn't deep enough to allow ships to get close to the port without dredging. Both dredging and building a pier can be pricey projects for ports to undertake. It's much simpler to run back and forth with smaller tenders to get people to and from the port. When you're at sea on a cruise and get up at say seven o'clock in the morning, you're likely to be one of the only people up and about. It can feel like this ship is a ghost town early in the morning. It's drastically different on debarkation day. On that day, the entire ship will be up and moving with their clothes already packed and likely standing in line waiting for the process of getting off the ship to begin. That's because cruise ships rush you off the ship extremely early. Head to a hotel on land and check out is normally sometime around 10 or 11 in the morning. It's time to get up, get ready, pack, grab some breakfast, and then head out. On a cruise, getting off the ship can begin before 8 a.m. And even if you don't get off the ship at that time, you'll still be asked to go wait in public areas and get out of your cabin until it's your turn to debark. It is a bit of a rushed end to your vacation. Of course, the entire reason that cruise lines want to get passengers off the ship as quickly as possible is to get ready for the next group that will be arriving in just a few short hours. In the meantime, thousands of cabins need to be cleaned and prepped for new passengers. In fact, if anything is crazy, it's not that you have to get off the ship so early, it's that the crew can get the ship ready to head back out with thousands of new passengers in such a short time. You'll notice that apart from a few special cases, any cruise you take has at least one stop in a foreign country. Typically, the entire cruise calls on foreign ports. What you don't see are trips that sail from Miami, head to Key West, and then stop in, say, Tampa and New Orleans before heading back to Miami. While sometimes U.S. ports are visited, there's always at least one stop in a foreign country. Even if you sail to Alaska, where the entire point is to visit several ports in the U.S., there's always a stop in Canada, usually Victoria, British Columbia, before coming back to the States. Considering all the port cities in the United States that would be of interest to passengers, it's crazy that the big mega ships don't have U.S. focused itineraries at all. The reason why is an old law that dates back to the 1800s. The Passenger Vessel Services Act was put in place to protect U.S. shipping. It still applies today. In regards to cruising, the law basically says that foreign flag ships can't take passengers from one U.S. port and drop them off at another U.S. port to end their trip. As well, a foreign flag ship can take passengers round trip from a U.S. port, but only if it visits a foreign country before debarking passengers. Since almost all major cruise ships are foreign flagged, they have to abide by these rules or face fines. Maybe in today's world, we are just used to being tracked. Seemingly everything we do online is stored somewhere. Even so, it is a bit crazy to think about how much you are actually tracked and watched on a cruise ship. To be fair, there isn't anything nefarious here, at least to our knowledge, but it's still crazy to think about. Consider when you go in the port, every time you leave the ship, you scan your card and a security officer checks the photo tied to your account. Spend all day in port and you'll have to scan the card again when you come back to board. And then when you're on the ship, you may or may not notice the cameras positioned seemingly everywhere around the vessel. Unless you were in your cabin or in a bathroom, there's a good chance a camera has you in its field of vision. Now, as we said, the cruise line isn't trying to snoop on you. There are good reasons for these actions. For one, scanning passengers in and out from the ship lets the staff know who is on board and who is ashore. It's actually essential for tracking who is still in port when it's time for the ship to depart. And as for cameras, they can help provide information in cases where there's an incident on board. Being watched anywhere, including on a cruise, is just a feature of modern life. Now it's your turn. Have something that doesn't make sense to you on a cruise? Let us know in the comments below and we'll see if we can get it answered for you. In the meantime, if you like this video, be sure to check out our channel and subscribe. You can also always visit cruisely.com for more on everything cruising.